Hey there, welcome to Southview Online. My name is Brittany and I serve as the online campus director. Thank you so much for joining us today. Up next, Pastor William will be joining us with the latest message from our series, Things Jesus Never Said. But first, here are a few things you should know. If this is your first time joining us or you recently discovered us here online, welcome. Our prayer is that after today's message, you truly know and believe that God loves you, he's for you, and we are too. We have a free gift for you, no strings attached, as our way of saying thanks for joining us this weekend. Head on over to southview.org slash connect to get started. It's now time to hear from Pastor William, so sit back, relax, take some notes, and I'll see you back here after the message. We are in the middle of a series of messages called Things Jesus Never Said. If you've missed any so far, you can always catch up at southview.org or by downloading Southview's app. I've asked you to imagine in this series with me for a minute, if you got an email saying that you had an appointment with Jesus, one hour in person, just the two of you, how would you feel about that? Excited? Nervous? Maybe a little anxious, thrilled? Would you be looking forward to it? Or would you be uncomfortable? What do you think he would say to you? Pastor Will Davis wrote a book, 10 Things Jesus Never Said, that I've been indebted to for this series. Davis says that when he asks people this question, that the responses are very similar, no matter the gender, the age, the part of the country, the background, young adults, middle schoolers, high schoolers, senior adults. They responded that they think Jesus would say things like, what were you thinking? I'm so disappointed in you. You missed my will for your life. You got what you deserve. Are they right? Are those responses actually something Jesus would say? I think it's important to learn what Scripture actually says, but also what it doesn't say. In this series, I'm tackling some of these statements, things that people think Jesus would say to them or or think that he even did say to someone else, things that people feel like apply to them about their mistakes, their failures, their shortcomings. I want us to ask the question that you've heard me ask often. What does Scripture say? Not what do I think, not what do I feel, or not what other people have said to me in the past. What does Scripture actually say? Because that's what matters. Why do we care, though? I mean, why do we care what Jesus didn't say? Shouldn't we spend our time focusing on what He actually did say? I get that. But I think this can be an incredibly valuable exercise for us. Here's why. Often, I find myself tending to project onto Jesus something that I would say. Something that I might have said. That I could say. Or something that I thought he said. By putting words in his mouth, I find myself doing something I should never do. What I want us to do in this series is call out the elephant in the room. I want to take away some of its power. I want to refocus our eyes and open our ears to what Jesus actually did say. Not what we think he said or what we think he would say to us. Today, I want to tackle something that I think many people think Jesus would say to them. Go do what makes you happy. Go do what makes you happy. And we've talked about before, this is something that comfy, cozy Jesus would say. It's okay. No problems. No worries. It's not, that sin you did, that's no big deal. Just go do what makes you happy. You want to be happy, right? So do I. I haven't yet met anyone who said their goal in life is to be miserable. And Jesus must want that for us, right? Did Jesus ever say this? Is this in line with his character and his teaching? Let's take a look at what Scripture says. Power on or turn in your Bible to the biography of Jesus that John wrote. It's the book of John. We're going to be in chapter 8, starting in verse 1 today. 
Verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law... Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say, Jesus? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. There's so many problems here. So these religious leaders caught a woman in adultery, in the very act of adultery. How exactly does one do that? I mean... Was this a trap they set? Were they, were they hearing rumors and they snuck around until they, aha! How, do, how exactly do you do that? They're quoting from the law of Moses, what we would call the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law. And the law said that both parties to adultery should be stoned to death. If she were caught in the act, there was most definitely a guy there. Where's he? I mean, they only bring her. Where's the guy? Isn't it funny how they pick and choose what part of the law they want to enforce? There was another part of the Mosaic law that they don't reference here. It said that if you see a brother or a sister who is about to sin against God, who's about to do something wrong, that your obligation under the law was to warn them, to warn them away from that sin. You were to warn them about the dangers of disobedience to God and pull them back from that temptation. I don't see that happening here. If she was caught in the act, well, they must have known what was about to happen. Why didn't they warn this couple? And speaking of that, the couple, where's the guy again? They bring her and they make her stand in front of Jesus and the crowd that he's been teaching. He's been teaching since dawn. Can you imagine how humiliating this was for her? If she she were caught in the act, she's probably barely dressed. Standing there, humiliated, incredibly embarrassed, and now to be shamed like this publicly in front of Jesus and in front of the crowd, this is the worst day of her life. How did she get there? Well, probably not all at once. But I heard someone say recently something that stuck with me. That decisions have descendants. And now she finds herself someplace that she probably never imagined she'd be. Facing very serious consequences for what she's done. And then the question from the religious leaders, well, the law says stoner, Jesus. What do you say? As Admiral Akbar once said so well, It's a trap! If Jesus said, go ahead and kill her, well, then he loses his rep for being full of grace and love. If he says, don't kill her, well, now he's breaking the law of Moses and apparently condoning the sin of adultery. No matter what he says, he loses, and the religious leaders win. To these religious leaders, understand the woman herself, her life, is just a pawn. She's she's incidental. She's disposable at best. She's a pawn in their game as they try to trap and discredit Jesus. So what's Jesus going to do? But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. The literal translation of the original language here is, If any of you is without even wanting to sin, If you've never even wanted to sin like this woman did, if you've never even wanted to sleep with someone you're not married to, then you go ahead 
and you be the first to throw a rock at her. Yikes. And then again, Jesus stoops down and writes on the ground. What's he writing? Well, no one knows. John doesn't tell us. I wish he did. Was he writing the the secret sins of the men standing before him? Was he writing verses from Scripture? We don't know. But whatever it was, Jesus' words convinced these religious leaders that their trap had failed. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, why would the older ones go away first? Because they had more track behind them in life. They knew their sins. They knew how imperfect they were. They knew where their minds had wandered to, where their lust would have taken them. They knew. And one by one, they dropped the rocks that they had picked up ready to throw, And they disappeared into the crowd. And in my mind, I can just hear those rocks as they hit the ground. Thud. 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 I like what theologian Gary Bird says. Jesus cuts through their double standard to force them to reflect on their own hypocrisy. Jesus then straightened up. And asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Note with me what Jesus does not say. Neither do I condemn you. So go do what makes you happy. Go follow your heart. Go ahead and you do you. What does he say? Neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. This was not condemnation. This was not a judgmental thing to say. It was full of love. You're free. He's telling her, go and live like it. Live in the freedom that I'm giving to you. Live a life that is better than where you've been. Because you're worth more than living a life like that. Jesus was not just interested in what a person had been. He was interested in what a person could be. Gerald Borcher says it this way. This story captures magnificently both the gracious, forgiving spirit of Jesus and his firm call to the transformation of life. Sin was not treated lightly by Jesus. But sinners were offered the opportunity to start life anew. This is one of my favorite recorded scenes in the life of Jesus. It forces me to put myself in several different places in the story. See, I've been like the woman, trapped by my sin. I've been like the crowd, watching others trapped by their sin and and waiting for judgment. I've been like the religious leaders, pointing out the sin of others, while incredibly... Ignoring my own. Have you ever seen someone else doing something wrong? How did you respond? What was your initial thought? What would you say? In our day, maybe it's seeing somebody not wearing a mask when they're supposed to. We have a lot of self-deputized mask police around, if you haven't noticed. You look away as though you saw nothing. Do you say nothing? Do you do nothing? Or do you point out the sins and the mistakes of other people? And sometimes even eagerly await their judgment and punishment. They'll get what's due. See, the religious police 
are still alive and well inside the souls of many. I think we can all find ourselves somewhere in this story. Somewhere in this episode from the life of Jesus, we can all relate to at least one part of this. And many of us can relate to more than one part. I'll never forget a conversation that I had many years ago. It was with a South viewer who had blown up her family to be with another man. Both families were destroyed in their choice. And I sat across the table and I asked her, why? Why would you do this? And I will never forget her response as long as I live. I wasn't happy. And God wants me to be happy. Decisions have descendants. We choose what we do, but we don't always choose the consequences that come with them. Here's what I know. God wants way more for you than a temporary fleeting feeling like happiness. He wants way more for you than that. Look at what Jesus does here. He doesn't wink at, he doesn't ignore the woman's sin. He acknowledges it. And he gives her what she needs to hear. Truth spoken in love. Go. Leave your life of sin. Go. Sin no more. Stop doing what you're doing. You're better than that. Your heavenly Father created you for more than that. I have something better for you because you have been chosen. You have been redeemed. You have been set free. So live that way. The world around us tells us that to be happy is our highest goal. That's the goal. That's what we aim for. Go do what makes you happy. But is that what Jesus would say? Not at all. Happy is a feeling, my friends. And feelings come and go based on our circumstances in the moment. Jesus wants more for you than a feeling. He wants you to experience a whole lot more than that. That's why you hear me ask this question so often. What does Scripture say? Because Scripture is the standard of truth that we can measure our experience against. It reveals God's absolute truth for all. That's hard. I get it. That's hard for some people to accept and to grab onto. But here's the fact, that without a belief in external absolute truth, then truth is defined by whatever I think. Whatever makes me happy must be good. If I'm not happy, it must not be good. Where does that road go? Follow that road a ways. See where it goes. It doesn't go anywhere you want to be. I mean, think about that. Think about it in terms of your diet. Whatever makes me happy must be good. Um, No, that's not right. That's not good. Okay? How about in terms of sex? Whatever makes me happy, that must be good. Careful. That road will take you to a place you do not want to be. A self-centered, unhealthy place. Remember, decisions have descendants, and you don't always see them coming until they're here. I like how Craig Rochelle talks about this. He says, Jesus did not say, go into all the world and preach whatever makes people happy. He did not say, whoever wants to be my disciple must affirm themselves, avoid the cross, and follow their own heart. He did not say, ask and it will be given to you because God is your celestial sugar daddy. What did Jesus tell this woman? Not to go do what makes her happy. Something way better. Neither do I condemn you. You are forgiven. You are loved. Go now. 
and leave your life of sin. You've been set free. You've been set free from the old pattern of your life. Set free to live the life that God created you to live. You're free. What does Jesus tell you? Not to go do what makes you happy. Something way better than that. Neither do I condemn you. You are forgiven. You are loved. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus offers you, too, the gift of freedom. You can be free. You can be set free from the old pattern of your life, and you can be set free to live the life that God created and designed you to live. You can be free. So what did this woman choose? What did she decide to do? We don't know. But I'll tell you, I hope to meet her in heaven one day. Because I want to sit down, I want to hear her story about what it was like that day in the temple courtyard. What it was like to hear Jesus' words. So unexpected and so welcomed. And I want to hear what she did with the freedom that he gave her. I want to hear what she did for the rest of her life. I want to hear what she chose. So now let me ask you, what will you choose? What will you do with the truth that we have seen in the scriptures today? See, that choice is yours alone. I want you to imagine with me, imagine just for a minute, a life not tied down to the choices of your past. Imagine a life characterized by the freedom that Jesus offers. A life where you're not the victim of your circumstances. But instead, you have found the freedom that comes through a relationship with Jesus. Listen to what Jesus actually said. And make a deliberate, intentional choice to accept his gift of freedom and to live in that, not tied to a fleeting feeling that comes and goes based on your circumstances, but freedom that comes through a relationship with him alone. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we, as we conclude today's look at your word, I pray that this truth would, seek, would, would soak so deeply within us. This truth that your desire for us is, is so much greater, so much bigger than a fleeting feeling. Your desire for us is to live in the freedom that you offer to us. The freedom of living as you created and designed us to live in a relationship with you. May today We say yes to that offer, that gift, that relationship. We know that when we do, the angels in heaven celebrate. And our lives will be transformed from this point on. We ask this together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you ready for the best summer ever? Let's take a look at some of our upcoming events. We're bringing the community together all summer long. First, we're having church and a picnic on Sunday, June 13th at 10 a.m. You can reserve your spot for that at southview.org Sunday. If you're a parent with young kiddos, then this one is for you. We've heard from so many parents that they'd love to join a group with other parents. So we're excited to share that this June, we're launching a new small group. If you're a parent and you're ready to connect with others, have some fun and grow in your faith, then head on over to southview.org Sunday to learn all the details and to sign up. Our mission here at Southview is to see people far from God be raised to new life in Jesus Christ. Everything we do here is possible because of your faithful financial support. 
If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can do that today on the Southview app or head on over to southview.org giving. It's an honor to have guest worship leader Gentry Morris join us today. So let's head into the music and I'll see you back here in a few minutes.
That's it for now. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We'd love to see you next weekend for church online Saturday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. As always, for ways to get connected or to watch on demand or to see our upcoming events, head on over to southview.org slash Sunday, or you can download the Southview Community Church app. See you next time.